Hey. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Good Hi. Evening, Good evening. Let us pay respects to Ajahn first. Good evening. Good evening. Did you, just, Malang. did you just finish your tea break? I think back and we also did the Pati Mocha recitation this evening. It's the it's the moon day today. So we have uh, the ceremony, all the monks come together and do the chanting and sort out any business. Right. So just before Ajahn, Ajahn Mali this afternoon, he finished off and then we went to the meeting and then we had a nice tea break afterwards. That's my my supper. <laughs> I'm already finished. Yeah. Okay, so are you ready to go? Yes. So here we go. We have half an hour apparently, so I'll try uh, and be quick. Ajahn, there are two questions on jhanas. Do you want to read both of them before you answer? Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay. The second question, first of all, they're not really that connected. The second question, uh, meditation of jhanas, will one end up in the, well, the first question, end up in the Arupa realms and develop psychic powers as a byproduct? <laughs> no, not necessarily at all. But, you know, if you do lots and lots of jhana meditation, you become very powerful, very peaceful, very happy. And most of the times that uh, you either become a, as the Buddha said in the Pasadika Sutta, either become a stream winner, a wise returner, non returner, or fully enlightened. But that's much better than psychic powers. And Ajahn, you've perfected your dhanas. Are you psychic? You should know. So once you're psychic, then you'll be able to tell. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that one. And Oh, yeah. What's the other question on jhanas? Oh, yeah, they said that each uh, something refers to the four different jhanas, the first tetrad, the second tetrad. And, of course, it cannot mean that. You know, when you're just still watching the breath, you know, you know the first tetrad of Anapanasati, that's not a jhana. And one of the wonderful things about you know, being a monk, there is we also have what's called the Vinaya, and these are the rules which we have to keep. We just was chanting them. And the jhanas, they are you no know, call. They're grouped in there as superhuman entertainments, Uttari Manusa Dhamma. They're huge things. And that's one of the reasons why if a monk says he's got those and he doesn't have them, he's lying about them, you know, intentionally lying, not because he's overestimating, then that is like a paragical offense. So that's why as monks, we have to be really, really careful. We know what we're talking about. And you know, when it comes to the, the jhanas, they're really incredible states of mind. So you, know, you don't sort of put them down as small things. They're really huge. They just wait, they happen. When they do happen, you certainly know about it. Anyway, for one born spontaneously into other realms, doesn't it mean that there is an entity for different in form, but yet continuous as in stream of consciousness? We don't call it an entity. In other words, it's a stream of consciousness. It's always changing. It's not something which is changing. It is just a process, which is one thing, and then that gives rise to another thing. And you just give the example of the, oh, what's it called? Uh, the mango, going from one mango to another mango tree. I gave that the other day. And there's nothing in the, the final mango tree, which was there in the original mango. You know, the, this, it's like the same. It's got some form, some, if you like, karma. Some sort of something which makes the first mango into another mango. But it's not, there's nothing in the beginning which is there in the middle, which is there in the end. It's totally different. So it's just this third form which the Buddha made very clear of like a cause and effect process. And the cause and effect process. One of the things which the Buddha said was the simile of the flame. And I just uh, just uh, tied it up a little, not tied it up, but just adapted it a little bit to say if you have a candle flame, candle flame depends upon three things. It depends upon the wick, the, the wax and the heat. 
If any one of those causes disappears, then so does the, the flame. The flame goes out. It doesn't go anywhere. It is also the flame, which are three causes, and that give rise to this perception of a flame. Any one of those causes vanish, and so does the flame. This is the cause of reality of our life. Now, the thing we take to be our will, the thing that we take to be our consciousness, is just like the flame. And when the causes go out, so does the flame. The cause is still there. One cause gives rise to another cause, which gives rise to another cause. And there's a sequence, what the Buddha called the stream of consciousness. So once you really understand that, you also really appreciate the great wisdom of Elton John. When he described the end of Princess Diana's like, life, like the flame going out. <laughs> that was only a joke, by the way. So, yeah, it's... It's totally different. It's a stream of consciousness. And you, you just look at a stream. It's a wonderful simile. Standing on a bridge, look at the stream. The water you see today is not the same as the water you see tomorrow, the water you saw yesterday. It looks similar, but the contents is totally different to what you saw the day before. And that's you, the stream of consciousness. That to obtain the fruit of the first stage, one needs to experience jhana, to experience non self. Then, how is it yes, I could attain the first stage without jhana? Hence, many think jhana isn't required. I think I explained that, that when they say that yes, attained the first stage, first of all, that it's more than likely he was got on the path to the first stage. And sometimes that there is no real clarity there. You know, what is the difference between the first? Uh, the entering the path and attaining the fruit. Because once you enter the path, it's going to happen, it has to happen in this lifetime, you will attain the fruit of the path. So it said, you know, that many, many people, you know, they said we were stream winners because they obtained the incredible faith or enough wisdom to go with that faith. And they became you know, the Dharma fairers or wisdom fairers. Uh, and that meant that they were going to get the stream winning before they died. So it was like certain they're going to get a stream winner. And that meant in Pali, in the, the language they used then, that they almost were stream winners. So anyway, and it's also the fact that did Yasa retain a jhana early on in his life? I know another person who became, in, well, actually he did do jhanas before he became enlightened. Remember the before the Buddha uh, even left home when he was a six or seven year old under the rose apple tree, spontaneously entered into a first jhana. So, you know, that was without any teacher. And it's the case that, you know, sometimes I've come across people, you know, who have got into a jhana. They never had any training in meditation, but, you know, they've let go so profoundly they got into these jhanas and there's no doubt that their experience was a real jhana and why and i think it's possibly because you know from the experience of previous lives and even though the body can't remember that from a previous life the mind remembers it and the mind can incline to what it's known before in a previous life and that was you know, my explanation why the bodhisattva you know known as siddhartha gotama could attain that jhana under the rose apple trees as a six or seven year old. No training at all, but that was obviously the karmic, almost like remnant, the echo from his previous life. Anyway, next question. <coughs> what is Buddhism view on money? Where and how should we spend money wisely? Any stories? Yeah, I know there was Ajahn Chah's famous story about money because I was there when he told this. You know, he made a prediction. It's only just a uh, not real prediction, but there was an interesting idea that in the future that people would run out of metal to make coins. They'd run out of paper to make banknotes. So he said in the future they'd have to find something else to use as currency. So Ajahn Chah, being a bit coarse, said, in the future, they'll probably use something like chicken shit. There's little pellets of chicken shit. When you go to work, they'll pay you in chicken shit. 
and uh, you put it in your pockets. And you'd be so proud if you get a raise in the amount of chicken shit you get a week. And people will be fighting over chicken shit. And there'll be the international, uh, IMF will become the international manure. And the people will be so proud of how much chicken shit they get in their life. And that's how I just I was talking. You know, what is money anyway? Paper is only the value we give to it. And same as coins, send the value you so ascribed to it. And so his views was, yeah, you've got to use money wisely. And the way to use money wisely is make sure you have given enough to your family. But no, but also know what the purpose is. The purpose is the money's not the purpose. It is what you get with the money is the purpose. And sometimes people they seek for money so much. They don't realize that money is so they can have a nice, peaceful, easy life. That's one of the reasons why like monks like me, I don't have any money at all. And I can still live a very peaceful, happy life. And I said, aren't you sometimes that we have money and we invest because of fear? And we fear what will happen if everything goes wrong. And I don't have any money to begin with, begin with so I'm not really worried if things go wrong. <laughs> I can't lose any money because I haven't got anything to begin with. But instead of working my life to save money and to earn money and put it in a safe place which doesn't exist, that I, like many monks and like many people as well, they spend their life amassing good karma. So they earn this wonderful credit of which comes from being kind to other people and looking after them. And that sort of credit is not stored in any bank, it's stored in people's hearts. And that's always there, you know, to look after me in case I, I need something. And it's always there, you know, to give to you when you need something. So I've got this incredible amount of wealth, you know, and all the good karma I've done over the years. That is my, my wealth. It's not measured in money. And it's stored in everybody who I've met and helped. And so it's very difficult to lose that. So it's, what is the purpose of money? And you can actually get that purpose just of making lots of good karma and being kind and helpful. Is it okay to do meta meditation not 100% peaceful? Read that once, you're not ready yet, meta. If there's even a slight aversion in the mind, it can transmit negativity and cause harm to other beings. No. If you're 100% peaceful, that means you're an arahat, fully enlightened. But no, it is you know, reasonably peaceful so you can relax. And then you radiate meta even to yourself as well. So you can be comfortable and kind. And the meta you radiate to yourself gives you incredibly good health. And it just makes the mind brighten up. So it becomes easier to meditate. And then you meditate to other beings as well. But you'll always have some negativity. You now, unless you're fully enlightened. And so because of that, don't wait until all the negativity is gone. Just if you're reasonably peaceful, so you can generate meta. And once you've generated meta, then you can spread it to others. And of course, as I'm going to do the meta meditation in 15 minutes' time, and you'll hear me say that the, the last person you send meta to is yourself. And the meta is really, 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 really strong. And then give love and kindness to yourself, and it really, really works then. But yeah, we'll come across that in a few minutes. Dear Ajahn, can one do dana in the name of a living close family member who does not believe in doing dana and can she gain such merits? That's a very nice question. Of course you can. So giving dana, just making something like a, a gift, a donation or, or food or just you know, going to a hospital and just helping out there. There's so many different ways of doing dana. Don't always think that dana is made with cash. It's, not, it's made by you giving something to somebody else, being kind, finding out what a person wants and giving it to them. And then very often we do that to our deceased relations, so we dedicate merit to them. And they may not believe in doing dana, but there's some acts of dana which are so beautiful that everybody, even if they, they don't believe in this thing, they get so much joy and happiness from seeing these wonderful acts of kindness and giving which people do in this world. And if you know, sometimes you may see that on, I just tried to think of an example of that, which sometimes you see on the, I or watch the news 
channels you know, on the internet and sometimes there's the good stories of people who do wonderful acts of kindness. And even if you don't believe in just the dana giving um, like good karma in your next life or anything like that, it gives you such a boost of happiness to see that in this world that we do look after one another. And acts of kindness which you see in others always bring you so much peace and happiness and joy. And that is getting the results. It's making a beautiful world. So, but if you do it in the name of another close relation, make sure you tell them. So I don't know if you believe in this or not, but I did this because you know, you are my mum or you're my dad and you helped me so much when I was young. So I'm gonna do it for you whether, you, whether you believe in it or not, I've done it for you. And it's a very nice act of good karma. And of course, you know, your mum and dad would appreciate you doing something good in this world. Hi, Ajahn, with the Taoist and family, I've experienced rituals, black magic done by adults. These have given me a lot of fear about unseen beings till now. How to stop this fear and shall matter to them? I mean your uh, family or to your, the unseen beings, but either way, that for the unseen beings is, is an old um, law, which you know, I've known since I was a young monk, that um, as if you keep things like five precepts and you're a good person, these uh, unseen beings cannot harm you at all. But the story which I say about that is that there was one you know, young lady, maybe in her 20s, you know, in Thailand, and she would come to the monastery where I was you know, every week. And she was a very a good girl, keeping you know, five precepts most days and even eight precepts on the... <coughs> the holy days and anyway that she was at a house apparently and she was just you know, washing her face and in the mirror in her house she saw this monster not her own face but this demon and of course you know she was really scared and she asked her mum you know what's going on and so they invited the monks to go to their house to do some blessings and uh, I didn't go at the time but you know these are my friends who went there and they said what happened was that this um, another woman, an elderly woman there, went into a trance. And when she came out of the trance, you know, the head monk there was asking sort of this woman in a trance, you know, who are you? And he got all the details that this was a, one of these uh, black magic monsters, an unseen being who had been hired to actually to kill this woman and she'd been hired by this young man who had proposed to this girl but the girl didn't like him and refused him so he went into town and just uh, hired this magician to, who had control of a demon to kill this girl and the, uh, the, the monster this demon had been trying for two or three years to get close enough to the girl to kill her but because she was so pure in her precepts and so good, he said he couldn't get close to her. And the monk said, look, you know, you want, this is really bad karma that you do this. So you know, please leave the girl alone. She's a good woman. So you will never get close to her. You'll waste your time. And he said, well, according to you know, my rules, if I don't kill her, then I'll have to die. And the monk said, it's much better that you die than you kill somebody else. And the demon accepted that, and the monk gave this demon, this monster, five precepts. So this was a possessed lady speaking in a strange voice, and uh, this demon who was possessing her at the time took those five precepts, and then the woman fainted. And when she woke up again, she was back to her old self again. The demon never reappeared. And it's one of those stories that you know we know from many, many instances like this. If you do keep five precepts even, and if you're even better than that, then monsters, demons can't harm you. You're invulnerable. So, if you really want to be free of the black magic or, or rituals and stuff, keep your five precepts and then nothing can harm you. Not just not demons, because you have more power to you. And But I don't know why people do rituals and black magic like that, because they usually get into a lot of problems and difficulties. Taoism is much better than that. 
And if one goes into the beautiful part of Taoism, instead of the, you know, just wanting to get some power from the lower beings and uh, exploit that power for your own financial or um, sensual needs, it's going to backfire on you eventually. It's bad karma. Anyway, that's how to stop the fear in yourself. And shower metta them. You can always shower metta to your family. And just little by little, they realize that you're much more powerful than any of these demons, even as a human being. Okay, next question, please. How important are the last thought moments to ensure a good rebirth? What happens if a person is too ill to be able to recall his past meritorious deeds just before his death? As anyone who's been with a dying person, there's no such thing as a last thought moment. It's like a, a series of events. I think death usually takes at least five or 10 minutes. I remember being with people who were dying you know, through the whole process to the time when the doctor you know, said, now they're dead. And I asked the doctor, you know, exactly what moment did they die? He said, you can't tell. The dying process started at this time and maybe five, 10 minutes later, the dying process was complete. Exactly what point was death is almost impossible to say. So death is a process, not a moment. And there's no such thing as a last thought, it's a last series of thoughts. And so, and if you are very ill, you know, at the time of your dying process, again, there comes a time which many people uh, can actually see. This is the relations and doctors and nurses see which has now a name in medical science called terminal lucidity. And terminal lucidity is when the person who is really ill, not able to speak. And then after the, when terminal lucidity starts, it always happens just before death, then they can speak and they open their eyes. It's like they're just like a normal human being. They're not sort of in the coma anymore. They're not got dementia. They can recognize everybody and speak. And that is like a little proof that no matter how sick you are, no matter how much a big brain tumor you've got colonizing your brain, and there's hardly any brain left, you think there's no possibility of any higher mental functions, such as memory. Just those last few minutes or few seconds before you die, the mind takes over. The brain may be too ill to be able to recall your past meritorious deeds, but your mind can. And that takes over and that does the memory stuff. In the same way that those of you who have seen uh, documentaries or experienced hypnosis, you can see that there's some things which this brain just cannot remember. But if you hypnotize that person, they can remember clearly what happened under hypnosis, because the hypnosis is going into uh, the mind but it is accessing the memories from the mind rather than from the brain. So the mind takes over when you get to that point of death. And so you remember everything, especially your meritorious deeds. The only thing to do is remember the instructions that this is what you should do. Now, when that terminal lucidity comes, the time of your death. Next question is... Uh, it's on. It's about a stream of consciousness. How is it that Nakula, Peter, Nakula, are able to be together for so many lifetimes? It's because the stream of consciousness carries those memories from the past. And sometimes they make that resolution when they die. I just want to be with this person again in the next life. And it's something which is quite strange. We see this even in, in, in the suttas in the time of the Buddha. It seems the same group of people get reincarnated, you know, close together again and again and again and again. It's as if that, you no, know, though we're dead, and, uh, you know, we're, our stream of consciousness has left this human realm, still we get born back. We just want to go back to, to be with the people who we lived with before. You might say unfinished karma, I more like it to, to think of it as is a, an attraction. You know, to people who were kind to you before, people you were trusted before, you know, or people you know can be of service and help you as a teacher be before. You tend to get reborn in the same sort of group again. And that means that, you know, you can continue the, the training and the experience. It's just like, you know, when you're at school and the, the holiday time comes, you leave school and you just 
leave your friends and you have a really good time. And then once school holidays are over, you go back to class again. It's like, you know, it's not the best simile, but it's the only simile how you die. You know, you leave, have a bit of a break. And then when you're ready, you go back and do some more learning in this world as a human being. So there's not a soul there, but it's a stream of consciousness, which in that carries the karma and the inclinations of what you like, what you don't like. Recently, I attended a Buddhist funeral, had been told by deceased family not to cry. If a family member cries, the deceased soul will stay and will not go for reincarnation. Is it true? Well, that's really an approximation. A lot of time at a Buddhist funeral, sometimes the person who's deceased has already left and gone to some heaven realm or gone to a rebirth, and they're not even around at the funeral. Sometimes people stay for the funeral. I mean, the dead person stays. You know, which means that you know that you always say a few words. The person is dead as well. The person who is dying and dead, they're usually a wise person, well, just an ordinary person, and you know, of course, they'll be concerned if someone in the family is upset, you know, because that's the last thing they want from you. They're dead, but they want you to be peaceful and happy and carry on their life. And I say the one most best thing you can do uh, to uh, show respect to your parents is actually to do what they ask you to do, not to cry for them, but to remember their example, work hard, look after one another, care for one another, forgive one another, and just um, have a beautiful life in their memory. But you know, crying, sometimes you can't stop it. Sometimes people are just so sad and they start crying. And if that happens, the person who's dead will probably just say, oh, it doesn't matter. You can cry if you want. And that means that you know the person who is dead, it will not stop them going for reincarnation. It may just delay them a little bit just because they want to make sure you're okay. And then afterwards, off they go. Okay, does rebirth in the heavenly realms use up our good merits? Would it possibly result in the next rebirth in the lower realm for non areas if the good merits are exhausted? Thank you. You have so many good merits. Uh, like I often tell you, they're inexhaustible. And same with your bad merits, they're inexhaustible too. There's too many of them. Um, but look at the positive side, the same with the good merits. They're inexhaustible. So why can't we just trust in the goodness and just allow our mind to see the beautiful bricks in the wall? And then you find you can see there's so many good merits in you that you know you'll only have some good rebirths. And also it does mean that you know, when you get reborn into this realm, or into the heaven realms are okay, but this realm is where you le really learn a lot, that you can actually just make the best use of this human birth. I learned so much and makes lots more of good merits, but even in making good merits, you make bad merits as well. But make sure the good merits are much more. And if you're, you're a person who looks for the good and the kindness and you trust in human beings, you can give so much to people. And of course, your good merits will keep increasing, which means you'll have much more energy, good health, attracted to wise people, which means you maybe able to make the next birth or even this birth, your last birth, and become enlightened. Okay, what's the next question? I've been bad-mouthed by these people when I've done nothing wrong, and they still do think they had done nothing wrong to me. They go around and keep telling bad things about me local, locally. In the <laughs> you know, that I know that, that happened to me. You know, when I gave uh, ordination to women, made them bikunis, or like they helped in that process. I know some of the things which I hear that even monks say I did are totally wrong, totally inaccurate. I think, oh no, that whatever they want to say, let them say it, because if I try and tell them, they upset at me. So you can't control other people, but what you can control is your reaction to them. So this world is sometimes you just have to accept this world, but how you react to it, that is the place you put most of your effort, mindfulness, wisdom, kindness. So if you've done nothing wrong, fine. You just go around your, your life and people you are close to, they will know what you've done. 
that you're a good person, a kind person, who's being misrepresented, but that happened. The story which I always remember, which inspired me so much, was of this senior monk in Thailand a long time ago. His name was Chaukun Tape Siddhi Muni of Wat Mahatat. And he was a very good monk, but he was also very wise and a skillful manager. So he was number two in the hierarchy in Thailand. And the, the old Sangharaja, the number one, was getting old and people knew that soon he would die. And this number two monk, Chaukun Tape Siddhi Muni, would be elevated to be the head monk of Thailand. And the next monk in line, number three, really wanted to be the head monk of Thailand. So how can you get rid of this number two monk? Even monks do these stupid things sometimes. So this number three monk listened to many of this monk's recorded talks, edited them, spliced them together, and accused this number two monk of being a communist. And that was the time that Thailand was paranoid about communism. And so they, he convinced the court that this number two monk was a communist. And so they disrobed him and put him in jail for two years. And later on, there was an accident on the, the highway going to Don Wang Airport. A car crossed the road to the other side and slammed into this convoy, which was carrying the Sangha Raja of Thailand. Oh, sorry, the old Sangha Raja died. And the number three monk became the Sangha Raja of Thailand. And then he died in an accident only a few weeks, I think, after he was promoted to be the head monk of Thailand. Car lost control, went on the other side of the road and crashed into the Sangha Raja's car. Had a police escort in front and behind. But this car crashed into the Sangha Raja's car and only injured the Sangha Raja. And it was a critical injury. The Sangha Raja died. And in Thailand, when something like that happens, that was weird. How come this head monk got killed straight away, almost you know, once he became the head monk? And so they, they investigated. They found out that those charges which sent this monk to jail were just pretty much set up. They didn't have any validity to them. So they released the monk, and when this monk was put in jail, disrobed, he was, had to wear white clothes, but he still kept his precept. He was still a monk, according to the Vinaya. And so he always said that was one of the most, two or three most wonderful years of his life, being in jail. He could really take a rest, really catch up on his reading and study and so much meditation. And I like that attitude, even though he was put in jail, and even though that you know he was a really... Um, on the newspapers as a bad monk. He didn't, didn't react to it at all. He, he made the best use of it. What a wonderful opportunity this is to actually to practice, to rest. And of course, later on, he was released from jail. He didn't want to be a Sangha Raja anymore. So he was just the abbot and meditation teacher in Wat Mahatat in uh, Bangkok for many years. Until he eventually passed away. I really respect his attitude to being imprisoned unfairly. He just took it in his stride. Thank you. It's a great little holiday for me. Monks like that, I really respect. So you can do something like that. People are accusing you of something you never, ever did. So just you never did it. Your opinion of yourself is much more important than other people's opinion of you. So when you have good respect for yourself, other people, what they say, just how would they know? And just let that one go. And your close friends and associates, they know what you've done. And they will always respect you. You don't need people like that in your life. You need good friends who know you and trust you. Okay. It's now time for the, the guided meditation. Or should we have a toilet break first of all, before they do the guided meditation? Or should we just do the guided meditation on loving kindness? Yes, thank you, Ajahn. Yes, what? <laughs> toilet break. <laughs> okay, toilet break, everybody, then. And after five minutes, I'll give you loving kindness to your bladder. So it's important. So toilet break five minutes so we can come back. Hee, <coughs>
There's so many people in this world who just, you know, have done good things and are criticised for it. And maybe later on in their life, you know, that even after they're dead, you know, people realise they were badly criticised. You read that story of that uh, mathematician, Alan Turing, who just basically, he saved so many lives by cracking that Enigma code, I think it was called. He was a mathematician. But then he was also gay. And because he was gay, he got no credit for what he did. But he only got a lot of problems from the government for being gay. And eventually he was convicted. It was illegal to be gay in England, just at the wartime. And then they took into no account the service which he'd done to saving so many lives during that Second World War. And only later on, I think last year, the Queen of England gave him a posthumous pardon. It's something they could do, so say sorry. We know a lot of people are criticized so badly, so falsely. And if you're wise, you realize that that's part of our life. Even the Buddha was criticized. I was blamed. And the Buddha just in one ear out, out the other ear. That's the best thing you can ever do. In the end, it's you know it's really it's only you who know your value. No one else. And if you have this kindness to yourself, this value to yourself, this self-love, meta to yourself, that's the most valuable thing in the whole world. Get it from others, that's just bonus. The essential part is to be at ease and peace and respect yourself. You don't, don't need to be perfect to respect yourself. Because there's no one who's perfect. When you see yourself, you've got a really kind heart, good heart. Sometimes it makes mistakes. That's why one is born as a human being to learn. But one never thinks those mistakes are personal failures, which will be there forever. They're just learning opportunities. As we grow. Okie dokie. Please let me know when we should start again because I can't see the room. I don't know if I will be still in the toilet. So just let me know when it's the right time. Did I see Sister Angie's face? <laughs> okay. So I couldn't hear that correctly. You say they're still waiting? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Excellent. Okay, I heard another little story this morning. What do you call sort of a line of five men waiting to get their haircuts outside of the hairdressers? A line of five men waiting to get their hair cut outside the hairdressers. It's called a barbecue. <laughs> barbecue, you know, when you <laughs> Australians are really into barbecues. Got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. Hair five or high five or something. <laughs> He, 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 good one. That's okay. A good one. Okay, nice and easy, yeah. Okay, do you know about the the boy who invited his girlfriend to the school prom, the formal, and she accepted. So he went to get a nice suit to wear. There was a big queue at the at the close hire firm. He, he waited in line for a long time. And then he had to get order the limousine. And there was a queue for that too. It's a long line. And then he had to order the flowers and there's a long line for that as well. And then when he got to the, the venue for the school prom, there was a long line of people waiting to get in. But he had his ticket, so he waited in line. And when he actually went in to the school prom, he asked his girlfriend what she wanted to drink. And she said, I'll have some of the punch. But there was no punch line. No punchline. Okay, a few people are smiling. They got that joke. Okay, you got to okay. add your joke now. Okay, okay. I taught you to do it. Some kind of meditation. <laughs> okay, okay. 
So, uh, this, should I do a forgiveness ceremony before I study meta meditation? Forgiveness for all the bad jokes I've told you in my lifetime. <laughs> Good idea. I can always do the meta meditation. <laughs> <laughs> do the loving kindness meditation first. Then you're so soft, I don't need to ask forgiveness. So close your eyes. And we just do a bit of ordinary meditation first of all, but you know, quite quickly. With your eyes closed, how's your body sitting right now? Relax it to the max. Your legs. Get your legs really peaceful and, and comfortable and easy. And your butt. And your back. Get a nice stretch. And your front, the organs and the tummies and digestive system. Heart and lungs. All this stuff in the front, just really bring to a beautiful state of ease. You don't have to do anything, body, just relax. Everyone's got their eyes closed, so you don't have to, to meet other people's expectations. You're just free to be. And you go up to your shoulders, relax them, and your arms and your hands. And up to your neck and your face. This whole body really loose. Nothing being held tightly, nothing stretched, nothing squashed. As easy as possible. So your kindfulness, the caring and the awareness go right through your body. You see anything which needs adjusting. You're more than willing to do this. It's like you're the conductor of an orchestra. The orchestra is your body, and all its parts. You just make sure that everything is happy, well-tuned, at ease, ready to go. And then you just look at your piezometer. How peaceful, how agitated are you? And just for a couple of minutes, bring more peace into your inner world. No past, no future. Shh. No commentary. You know this moment without giving it a name. You can feel the delight of not being forced to describe things, not trying to capture them like when you make a photograph. You enjoy knowing this moment and letting it vanish so the next moment can come in front of your awareness. Feeling safe enough to relax to the max. Peaceful. Now we'll start the loving kindness meditation. The usual one which I would have been giving in, I think um, in PJ, or maybe in the Genting Highlands, if I was I'd been able to get to Malaysia this time of the year. We'll finish off with a loving kindness meditation. So just imagine, imagine that you've been walking down a street somewhere. And you hear the sound, sound of something moaning, crying, a sign of desperation, of suffering. You don't know where it's coming from, but you follow the sound because you're kind. You want to see help. Some being is really hurting. You follow that sound into a secluded part of the street 
into a dark part of the, the alley, into a little dark corner of that alley. And there you hear the sound of a little kitten. A little kitten has just been freshly born. And in a few days, it's been alive. It's been abandoned by its mother. It's been trying to get some protection, some care, some food. But every time it's come out from this little safe corner, it's been scratched, bitten, chased away. Little beings need protection. We are big beings. So you go closer to that corner, you see these big eyes, cat's eyes. They're looking at you from a safe distance. You don't need to have psychic powers to know that pain, that those eyes carry 99% of fear, 1% of hope, 1% of hope that maybe the being you watching her will be that one kind person to look after her, protect and feed her, and her mother is gone. When you look at those eyes, you say to that little kitten, the imaginary kitten, it's my imaginary source to develop loving kindness, my abandoned kitten. You say to that little bear, little kitten, the door of my heart is fully open to you. Please give me the privilege to serve you. It's not a burden because it's part of my life to care and serve others. Little kitten, please let me look after you. And you see those eyes become softer. From 1% of hope, maybe 10% of hope. But that little kitten is still terrified every time it's trusted someone. It's been a painful result. So you keep spreading loving kindness, this imaginary pair of eyes in the dark corner of a secluded street or alley. Little kitten, I will care for you. I will never harm you. I have the resources. I've got a house, a flat. I've got a cave where I live as a monk. I can look after you. Please come out. And little by little, you imagine these feelings of metta coming out from your chest, from your heart region. This force of caring for others when you don't need to. This force of love to the things which are really suffering. And this little kitten feels that power of your love and comes out a little bit further. You hold out your hand. You move it slowly towards that, that kitten. And the kitten comes out a bit further. Allows your hand to touch her. That little kitten is terrified. But this also knows it has to trust someone. And you may be that person who can give that trust back. You touch that little kitten. And you know that cats, even kittens, their fur is always like satin, so smooth and clean. But this little kitten, its fur is all hard, it's clotted, it's on blood, it's dirty. But as you touch her, you move your hand more underneath its body. You can feel just the wounds of that little kitten. You can feel its bones 
hardly any flesh on that kitten at all. You don't know when it must have last eaten or had some milk or whatever. And so slowly, not wanting to hurt that kitten at all, you pick it up. And it lets you. The loving kindness has reduced its fear to maybe 30% and its hope and trust is infinite. You pick it up and you bring it to your chest as gently as you possibly can. You know that it's one force move. That little kid will jump up and run away, even though it's in pain. You bring it to your chest area. You warm this bag of bones and fur. It's hardly got any flesh on it at all. That kitten must be just so starving. You just warm it with your warmth. Food will come later, but trust and love and protection come first. Dear little kitten, the door of my heart must be open to you. I will look after you. I'll find you something to eat. Milk and fish and chicken, whatever you like. I won't make you a vegetarian, you're a cat. And you cuddle it. You feel this body which was very rigid at first with fear. And so soft. We trust you. You may even hear this first little purse as it closes its eyes. Understanding that you will never ever harm or hurt it on purpose. And instead you, from your heart region, you develop all these incredibly powerful feelings of loving kindness towards this little being. It's like, a, as I mentioned, it's loving kindness feels like a golden light to people. And that golden light is coming from your real heart in your chest. It's going through your skin and entering this hungry kitten's body. And send your loving kindness as you visualize this closed eyes, tiny little ball of emaciated flesh and bones. You spread the loving kindness to the end of the cat's tail, the bottom of its little paws, right through its whole body, to its head and its ears and whiskers. Dear little kitten, you have a friend. Someone will care for you, and look after you and feed you and protect you. They'll give you a safe place to sleep and to play and to be naughty, which young kittens always are. And I just enjoy feeding you, seeing you grow and seeing you become a real cat. Just ask you to be kind to others, as I'm kind to you. And give all this wonderful loving kindness to this being, who even like falls asleep in your grasp. You feed it later on. All this kindness which is there in your heart, you give this imaginary being, because they need it desperately. And for those of you who've never done this before, it's just how you generate those first emotions of loving kindness, even though it's an imaginary being. You can make that imaginary being whatever you want. It's a means of developing the kindness, the loving kindness, the well-wishing is really important. And then you just allow the image of your little kid to disappear for a while. And then you imagine somebody else, one of your closest friends, a lover, parent, someone who really needs your loving kindness, someone who's suffered a tragedy, someone who's suffered difficulty, but this time a real person. Imagine them right now and how 
similar they are to that abandoned kitten, because sometimes people feel abandoned and afraid, like no one cares for them or understands them. This is a real person you're very close to. Say to that little being, your friend, your lover, your relation, I really care for you. May your pain and unhappiness, your tragedy, it will wear away. May I help it wear away. May I support you, care for you, look after you. Be your friend. Be your friend who can smile with you to let you see that this world has a lot of beauty. As well as the suffering in life, there's a lot of joy and happiness and kindness. I'm showing that to you now by caring for you. There's this golden energy like it's coming out of your chest. It's now going to that real being. Where they are in this world, a friend, someone you spent time with, someone you know. And you put that loving kindness into their body up to their head, down to their toes, to the tips of their fingers, all over them, right through them, inside, on the surface. There's this golden light of loving kindness drenches them, and soaks them, and bathes them in your power of well-wishing. You can always have these good attitudes to people in life, caring for them. If you notice a feeling in your chest, my chest now is tingling ever stronger. The more I give of loving kindness, the more powerful that force of loving kindness is. And then I imagine another being. Maybe they're a healthy being. Maybe you feel they don't need loving kindness, but everyone in this universe needs loving kindness. They all benefit from the fact they know that other people care about them. As you know that you care about others caring for you. So choose another person you're very close to. They may be, again, having a, a peaceful life, successful, whatever, but nevertheless, you're close to them somehow. So imagine this sitting right in front of you or standing right in front of you. You look into their eyes and send this beautiful golden light of loving kindness right inside of them, up and down. And maybe you'd be surprised you'll find some parts of them which really need some kindness. They haven't told you about the cancer diagnosis or the disappointment they've had in their life. People hide their pains so unnecessarily. It doesn't matter because when you give them love and kindness, it goes right inside of them. It finds their pain and heals it. My dearest friend, I care for you. You send this loving kindness up and down their body. And it heals them. Makes them relax and be at peace. And then without opening your eyes, Imagine all the people who have been on this retreat. Maybe people in the same room as you, if you're in a hotel room. All the people you've seen on the screens. All the people who have worked so hard to make this possible. All the people who have been part somehow of this retreat. You give this loving kindness to each one of them as they give it to you. It's like a web starts to manifest of loving kindness energies going from me to you, you to them, and then back to me and backwards and forwards and reinforcing the energy of loving kindness to all beings who are on this retreat. So with this beautiful golden energy, we share the unspeaking wishes May all of you be at peace, be happy, in real happiness, 
of the Kitty Sukha, the joy, the delight of being at rest, at ease. As all the problems in your life just are not as powerful as the feeling and the giving of loving kindness towards one another. As we establish this connection of friendship and sharing. So it gets so powerful. And this is an international web of loving kindness. It spreads beyond our group. It goes to all the other beings which are close to you. All those in the hotel, in the center, in your house, in your monastery. This, this energy tends to just grow like an almost like a nuclear reaction, but not a destructive one, a, a healing one. There's this powerful golden energy of loving kindness coming from your own chest. It goes to all these other people on this retreat and from them around and around, building up energy into it goes beyond the room in which you sit. Goes to all these other beings, you know, in the village, in the town or the city where you are. This golden energy starts to spread over the country in which you sit, over the continent in where your country lies, this whole world. May all beings be happy and well. We mean that. It does have power. May in this moment, may you not feel afraid. Many of you may feel that, like that little kitten. So alone, because of maybe COVID. So afraid, in pain. Just to know that people care about you. They're sending, the, they're sending so much energy, kind energy, love energy to you, to all beings who are sick or care for the sick, who are alone in lockdown, separated from people they love, even to those people who feel they're having a happy time. You give loving kindness indiscriminately, like the sun shines on all beings, good and the bad, no matter who they are, when it rises in the morning sky and travels over our lands, warming and healing and caring for everybody, the sun. That's your heart now. Give this golden energy and light to all beings. And this world really needs that. They need hope and trust and care and beauty. And then, Always remember, as I indicated earlier, there's one being you always miss out on, and that's you. This being who bears your name. Imagine them standing in front of you like you're looking in a full length mirror. This person you've grown up with, you've gone through so much difficulties with and so much happiness, you. You look with sensitivity, with kindness, with empathy at you. And tell yourself, I care for me. I really do. All my faults and silliness, I forgive that. Because loving kindness is much more powerful than any irritations. You spread this loving kindness, this power of golden light, right up and down your body. You don't just think it, you feel it. This energy going down to your toes and up again, right through your legs and butt and back, right through your head, which may be tight and tense. And everything gets relaxed and loose right down to all your organs of your body, which you've worked so hard and down your arms to your fingertips, which become alive with the power of your own kindness. May I be happy and well. May I trust myself. 
may I feel at peace. Realizing I'm more than good enough. I don't need to achieve anything more in this world. I can if I want to, but I don't have to. As you experience your own beauty, your goodness, and your kindness. Just like that little kitten, you have hope, freedom, and love. Just stay there for a minute or two. Now to take this loving kindness to spread all over the big world. Imagine that golden energy which is spread far and distant. Imagine all that light coming back, but leaving the warmth, the warmth you leave out there to all the beings you may have touched. Bring the light back. This golden light comes back, back into the country in which you're sitting drawing back into the room in which you're sitting, back into your body. And this golden ball of light, it's like a nimiter, a golden ball of light right in your chest, collecting it to preserve it for another time. And imagine your heart like that lotus, fully opened, a pure white lotus. And its petals just close over that golden light to keep it secure, safe. It's a seed to be used the next time you do your loving kindness meditation for yourself and the whole world. The lotus closes up in your heart to protect, preserve loving kindness. Now I'll give the closing chant. So please keep your eyes closed while I give this chant of well-being for all of you and for those beyond you. Sāpāruga vini mūto Sāpāsāntā pāvājito Sāpāvēra mati gandho Nīpūto chato vāng pāvā Sabiti o iwa chantu Sabaro go ina satu mate O wan wan tarayo Suki di gayu go pawa apiwa Dan hasi litsa ni chang vuta pachalino chataro dhamma watanti ayuvano sukhang ala. be happy and well and thank you for giving me the privilege of sharing with you Ooh. okay and of course that's thank you also comes from Ajahn Bamadi as well he told me at tea time it's a wonderful opportunity to serve you had a very enjoyable time So now apparently there's speeches. <laughs>
<laughs> to close off with. But oh, I'm supposed to give you the five precepts. So I hereby give you the five precepts. So please take them. You know what they are. You don't need to repeat them. What you do need to do is to keep them. Okay, so we got speeches ready. Has everybody speeched out? John, I would yeah. like to sh share uh, on behalf of all the volunteers and everybody on the screen. If oh, you yeah. have every by, uh, by body speech of mine on the three time frames that you mentioned, yeah. past, <laughs> present, and future, yes, we ask for your forgiveness. Of course, you are always be forgiven, and it's nothing to forgive. And please also forgive me for all the silly jokes. <laughs> And also not just for the jokes, but sometimes I always you know, try my best when I answer the questions for you. And sometimes I think afterwards, did I really get the problem in that question? And I try my best to be sensitive enough to answer the question properly. I'm sure that some questions I've answered well, but I'm sure also that some questions didn't quite get the answer as a person expected it. But nevertheless, keep asking those questions. If you don't get the right answer this time, maybe next time. And there is okay. always a next time. Change your speaker. So please forgive me for any errors or Thank anything you. which I've done. Sorry, sorry. Internal speakers. Okay, now I would like to invite Dato Sri. Yes. Ah, to speak? Victor, Say yeah. a few words. Yeah. Dato Sri. Am I supposed to be speaking? Oh, there you oh, are, Victor. Good evening. Yeah, I can see you. No, we do on this side. Right? Hi. Can't hear anything from John. So. Can't hear anything. No, I did see Victor a few moments ago. Uh, what happened? We can there hear. He is. We can hear you. Good microphone. Internal microphone. Yeah. Speaker is uh. Good. I'll mute those speakers. <laughs> New to Zoom. No sound. No sound. Same as system. I can see you and I can hear you. <laughs> oh. He can't hear you. <laughs> uh -huh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Terence, am I supposed to be on right now? Yes. Ah, okay. Five minutes ago. All right. <laughs> sorry. 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 Uh, apologize because we have uh, to sort the speakers and all that. All right. So, um, a very good evening, uh, Chan Brown and the brothers and sisters in the Jama. On the 29th of September, I received a WhatsApp from Angie suggesting that BGF Malaysia and Bodhinyana Singapore should join forces uh, to conduct a year-end meditation retreat under Ajahn Brahm. Well, one day before that, I received an email from Ajahn Brahm saying that NG had requested him to conduct a meditation retreat over Christmas holidays. At that time, I was actually on a retreat, but I saw that there was a special opportunity for BGF to collaborate with Singapore. Uh, we share the same teacher and the same spiritual advisor. <laughs> so Ajahn Brahm could not come to Malaysia, nor could we travel to Perth. So online retreat by Zoom becomes the best alternative. If it is online, Ajahn Brahm could reach to people in different countries at the same time. Now, after BGF and Bodhinyana, uh, Singapore had its first coordination meeting, I received a call from brother Pang Hong. The <laughs> Buddhist fellowship from Singapore would like to collaborate on the year end retreat. Now he said that Ajahn Brahmali would normally conduct sutta classes for BF at the end of the year. But this time around, he will be teaching at our retreat. So you see the coronavirus has brought our three organizations together to collaborate on the year end meditation retreat with BGF hosting the event. So 
Thank you so much to Bodhinyana Singapore and this fellowship for your inputs and for being co-organizers in this retreat. The two Achans can benefit more people in different countries, including Indonesia and Australia, by running just one course. Wow, this really saves time and energy. This is an efficient usage and conservation of energy, which is compliant with the green agenda. <laughs> The coronavirus has indeed given Ajahn Brahm a break. In fact, this is one of the rare occasions when Ajahn Brahm could spend his Christmas holidays in Perth. For the past many years, his Christmas will be spent in Malaysia with BJF in KL and Mahinda Rama in Penang taking turns to organize the year-end retreat on alternative years. Now, as Ajahn Brahmali said yesterday, that the sutta becomes a little deeper each time it is read and the dharma sinks in you. And I feel it's the same way with the meditation retreats conducted by Ajahn Brahm. Although Ajahn says that he keeps on repeating the same things and stories <laughs> in the retreat, but sometimes he has to tweak the stories to give them a little twist. Now, actually, I don't mind re re listening to the repeats. I feel that there are many layers of understanding. Each time when we listen to these stories, there are, we go to another layer. But this retreat is so rich in content and advice, and we benefit so much from Ajahn Brahm's own meditative experiences and insights. And we are struck by the authenticity of his teachings. And we also learn from him, an incredibly wise teacher, Ajahn Chah, had been when we hear stories about him. Now I'm sure that over the 600 participants we, that are enrolled in this retreat, there are many things that have been picked up over the course of the last six days. I hope that all of you will continue your meditation practice and your spiritual journey after the end of this retreat. For me, I must say that I get very inspired and I begin to understand what is meant by relax to the max. <laughs> <laughs> now I have heard this, this advice from Ajahn Brahm before, but I must say that this retreat this time the message really sinks in. You know, in meditation circles in Malaysia, some yogis go around saying that metta meditation is good, but why waste time practicing metta when you should actually be practicing vipassana meditation? Uh, that is almost like relegating uh, uh, metta meditation to a second class status. But in this retreat, I received the license and full endorsement from Arjun Brahm to practice metta in this retreat. I realized that by practicing metta meditation, suddenly this time around, I've done more metta than I've done in previous retreats. I can be truly relaxed to the max when my mind is peaceful and settled and the hindrances are subdued. It is actually easy to watch the breath. Now, Arjun has given us a very good analogy about the thousand petal lotus that opens up under the rising sun and the warmth of the sun is the mindfulness and kindness that opens up the body and mind. Achan also says that in deep meditation, you need emotion and matter is a positive emotion. By focusing on matter, which is a beautiful object, we derive much happiness and joy and the mind will naturally be drawn to happiness and joy. So, as what we learn from Arjun, the practice of metta can lead to the experience of nimitta and later on leading to jhana, which gives the power and energy for vipassana practice. So, I would like all of you to join me to thank Arjun Brahm and Arjun Brahmali for conducting this year end retreat. We are so grateful to both of you for conducting this retreat and the Sutta class. It has really been beneficial to inspire us along the path, to guide and motivate us in our meditation practice and to help us grow in the path of Dhamma. Your teaching has given us, given rise to various insights and realizations. For me, the meditation on dying uh, or the con contemplation on death led by Ajahn Brahmali yesterday was especially insightful on what we will go through during dying and what we will be ready when it happens. Actually, I find that the process is very familiar. It's almost like getting into Samadhi. So actually now, 
I realized that there's nothing frightening about death. No, Arjun Brahm says that he's now old. He's an old man now. And his monastery <laughs> factory is producing many good teachers that will enable him to retire. Now, personally, I don't think that will happen. <laughs> no, <laughs> Q&A a or tell a joke or story like Arjun Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> I must, I must express my gratitude to uh, Leonard Tay for conducting the stretching exercise during the retreat. And thank you to our friends from Ehi Pasiko from Indonesia for joining us in this retreat for yet another year. Saudara dan saudari dari Ehi Pasiko, Indonesia. Terima kasih. Yeah? Uh, I must also give a big thank uh, to the BGF retreat team led by uh, Terence Xiao. Uh, and the team includes uh, Bobby Ng, Alex Lim, Angie Ng, Chi On, uh, Cheng Im, Jennifer Wong, Sinan, and Lai Kim Lui. I would express, I would like to express uh, my thanks to the team at the Bodhinyana and BF for your inputs to this retreat and for the smooth running of this retreat. You have all worked so hard to make this really successful and really a beneficial uh, retreat for all of us and you deserve a big round of applause and maybe we seek blessings for Arjun Brahm and Arjun Brahmali for their continued good health and strength to spread the Dhamma. Many lives are still waiting to be touched by your compassion and teaching. Here, we are not talking about coronavirus. We are talking about their Karuna virus. I'm looking forward to your continued support to the programs that we run at BGF. I also welcome future collaborations from our friends from Singapore, from Indonesia and from Australia on projects that benefit our members and our Buddhist community. May the light of Dharma shine ever brighter with our dedication in studying, practicing and spreading the Dharma. Sukihoto. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Um. Invite Sister Angie from Bodiana, Singapore, and Brahm Center. So she's now not in Hyatt anymore. She's in what Phuket, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my dream destination. Yay. Since I'm go I'm going to be saying uh, politically incorrect things, I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so may I request BGF to turn off the recording so that I can be truly candid as I'm not going to be saying, I'm making a speech like Victor Wee, uh, which is